That long, messy chain of if-else statements you're using for your autonomous is holding your robot back. It's hard to read, a nightmare to debug on competition day, and makes adding new steps a huge pain. There is a much cleaner, more powerful way to structure your codes that's used across the entire engineering industry. Learning this will make your autonomous routines more reliable and your code infinitely easier to manage. I'm Coach Pratt, and for over a decade, I've taught robotics and mentored FTC teams to national championships and inspired word winners. I've seen teams completely transform their on-field performance by adopting the method that I'm about to show you. In this video, I'm going to break down what a state machine is and why I think it's superior to traditional logic for complex tasks. Then we'll get practical and program one from scratch that you can adapt for your own FTC robot. What exactly is a state machine and why might you might want to use one when you're programming for FTC or for robotics? Uh, a state machine is effectively a, it's a set of states or ways of being that your robot remembers and transitions between based on events or external stimuli. So for example, we're thinking about a basic autonomous period. You may have to drive forward, pick up an object, turn, and then place it inside of a bucket. So those are four distinct states. You have drive forward, pick up an object, turn right, and then place it in a bucket. In a traditional programming approach, you would drive forward, you would pick up the object, then you would pause, you would probably wait and turn for a specific second, then you'd do another pause and you run, and you'd have this sort of as a large chain of if and else statements. In a state machine, you would have four individual states or methods effectively we have specific actions being in place. So for instance, one state might be driving forward to detect an object. The second state might be picking up that object once it's detected. The third state would be the rotation state or the turning state. And the fourth state would be moving forward and placing it inside of that bucket. So why might a state machine be more useful than something like a traditional large if else, if else, if else, if else statements? One of the biggest benefits of a state machine is that things continue to happen in a loop. It's more similar to what real roboticists use when it comes to making PLCs or using other microcontrollers like Arduinos or ESP32. You typically design these as state machines. State machines also generally non-blocking. It lets you do something while you're waiting for something else. You can read sensors, you can update telemetry, and so on while you're within a state with having to wait for something else. So in a traditional approach, you might drive forward, wait two seconds, turn right, wait two seconds on sort of a time-based approach, what a state machine lets you do, it lets you move forward until a specific condition is met, and then you break out of that state, move into the next one. And this allows you to keep track of if something unexpected happens, if something happens sooner before you think, and so on. Another benefit of state machine is it makes it way easier to debug. Uh, in a traditional if, else, if, else section, you run into things like, a, you kind of think of it like a train. You have a specific track that you're running down, and if there's any issues along that track, you need to stop, bring a train back to the start, and then run it through that track again. With the state machine, you can test individual states as they go, and it makes it much easier to debug. And the state machine is kind of like a bus. You can move up to a bus stop, you can wait, then you can look at what the conditions are, move on to the next bus stop and wait, check what the conditions are, you can avoid other things, and so on and so forth. I'm a big fan of state machines, and once you figure out how they work, I think you'll understand that it. it it's actually a little bit easier for program with robotics, especially when it comes to debugging. So let's go ahead and let's actually start programming something in a state. Now for this, I'm going to be using my programming test bench. It's not required that you use a programming test bench. You could set this up on your standard robot. This is going to make things a little bit easier here. And then we're also going to be using our driver hub and our gamepad. We're going to use our gamepad to position through our state. So effectively, the only thing you really need today is a driver station. Uh, in your gamepad, and then just a control hub doesn't have to be on a test bench. So I am going to go ahead and pull this in, and let's go ahead and let's start by making a new class. And we're going to call this one state integer. Oops. Integer practice. And our public class is going to extend op mode. Inside of our op mode, we always need two methods. We're going to make a public void init and a public void, oops, not start, public void loop. Up at the top, because I'm using this program test bench, if you remember from previous videos, we're going to go ahead and initialize this as our new class. So we're going to go ahead and say test bench bench 
is equal to a new test bench object. And then we're also going to create a new integer variable called state. Inside of our initialization method, we're going to initialize our bench. So we're going to say that our bench dot init, and we're going to call it with hardware map so we can have all of our hardware uh, pulled in. And then we're going to set our state initially to zero so that we're always starting from that first state. Now, later on, we are going to change this state to a text-based setup, but it's going to be easier if we start this with an integer to learn how state machines work initially. So inside of our loop, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to print to our driver station, what is our current state? So we're going to say that telemetry.addData, we're going to say cur state. Oops, that should be a comma and state. So that we always know at the top of our loop, what is the current state that we're sitting in before we engage inside of our loop. Now let's actually get into our state machine. Now a state machine doesn't use a large section of if else. Instead, it uses uh, case statements and switch statements to keep track of that. So we're going to write the word switch. And then inside brackets, we're going to write state. And now we're going to come up with things called cases. So I'm going to say case zero, which is going to be for that initial zero state. So in this case, this case zero, we're going to tell our user how to get out of the state. So we're going to say telemetry.add line, or say to exit state, press A. And then we're going to do an actual check. So now we can do our if statement. We're going to say if gamepad1.a, which means we've pressed gamepad1.a, we're going to say state is equal to 1. So how that logic works is we've got a switch statement here, which is inside of our main loop. It's going to check what is the current state or what's the current case. And the case we're checking off of is that state variable. Because we set it as zero initially, we're going to go into case zero. It should print to our driver station to exit state, press A. And then if the A pad is pressed, it will make it go to a new state. Now our state is one. Now, before we finish off this, we have to make sure we put in something called a break statement. So what a break statement does is inside of this case, it's going to run everything inside that case until it reaches a break statement. And then it will skip back out of that switch statement and go back up to the top of our loop. If you do not put a break statement in, it's going to go ahead and run the next case as well, which of course we don't want. So let's go ahead and write another case. We're going to start case one. We'll add in a telemetry.add line. And we're going to say to exit state, press B. And then we're going to put in another if statement here. So if gamepad1.b, we can say state is equal to 2. And then we'll put in another break statement down below. Let's put in one more case here. We're going to say case 2 because we've added an option to be able to have a state of two. And then we're going to say telemetry dot add line. So we can, oops, not add action, add line. And we're going to tell our user to exit state, press X. Yes, that is a button on the controller. And then if gamepad... Uh, one, oops, gamepad one dot x. We're going to say state equals three. And then we're going to write break at the end of our last statement. Now, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to add in a default case. So we're going to write the word default for our default case. And we're going to say telemetry dot add data. Or well, actually, we're just going to add line. We'll say that auto state machine finished. So let's go ahead and run through this state machine quick so we can figure out how that actually works. 
So we've got one, two, three, four different states that exist. State zero, state one, state two, and the default state. The default state will run if none of those states that we have put in exist. So in this case, when we first start our code, we're going to start in case zero. So inside this loop, we're going to print our state. Oops. Then we're going to go into our switch statement for our state. If the case is zero, we're going to say, hey, to exit state, press A. And then if the gamepad A is pressed, it's going to break the state. So while we're running through this, if we're not pressing the A button, it's going to ignore these other three cases. And it's just going to run case zero, then telemetry. Case zero, then telemetry. Once we break out of that state, then it goes into case number one. Again, it would be the same thing for section B, and then gamepad X, and then eventually we're going to run in that auto statement. So let's go ahead and boot up our control hub, and let's take a look at what this looks like. So while we're waiting for that to boot up, you may think that, hey, this is a lot more lines than just using an FL statement. It is more lines, but again, it makes it significantly easier to debug. It also makes it a lot cleaner of a code. You're having a lot less things running through because it allows you to run individual states. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the driver station here. Oops, actually, I realized that I never actually built the program. So before we can actually finish that off, we have to make sure you write in at autonomous in order for that to actually run. Otherwise, it won't show up. And we're going to go ahead and run this on our rev control hub. So I'm going to go ahead and build this. And let's install this onto the control hub. Okay, so we're now booted up. So let's go ahead and go into the autonomous section. We're going to grab our state integer practice. We'll go to initialize. We'll run this. So right now it's saying the curse state is zero. To exit the state, press A. So let's go ahead and press A. Oops, we forgot to initialize that control pad. Let's go ahead and press A. And now on the driver hub, it says curse states one. To exit state, press B. Let's press B. Curse states two. To exit state, press X. We'll press X. And then the auto state machine is finished. So you notice that it's always writing that curse state three, and then the auto state is finished. Now, here's a really cool thing when it comes to that debugging. Let's go back to our start statement. And let's actually start at state number one instead of starting at state zero. So we can actually start our autonomous without having to comment things out or anything like that. We'll go ahead and, and create this at that start point. So let's go ahead and run this and we'll build this new one. You notice that we should skip right over the press A and we should get into curse state one and have it exit at state B. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this autonomous. And now you notice that it completely skipped over state zero and we're currently in curse state one. To X state, press B and then press X. And now we're finished our auto state machine. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that. So hopefully you can already see that it's a lot faster to be able to get these things debugging. Now, you've probably noticed a problem as I alluded to at the start of this in that we're currently using numbers as these states, and it, which means that if we want to add something in later or we want to move things around, we need to take all these numbers and adjust them. That's really inefficient. Uh, and we want to be able to do an easy way to do that. So we're going to use something called enumerate instead. And what enumerate lets us do is it lets us have text-based labels for our individual states. It's also far more descriptive. It's going to make our life a lot easier as well. So to do this, we're going to go back to uh, the top of our code and we're going to get rid of this int state. And instead, we're going to say enum state with some open curly brackets. And here in all capitals, we can go ahead and write what our states are. So our first state is wait for underscore A with a comma. We have another wait for B. We have a wait for X. And then we have a finished state. So after we create that object, we're actually going to assign that. So we're going to say that the state enumeration state is equal to state dot wait for a, because that is the very first state that we have. And inside that initialization statement, we're going to go ahead and say that state is equal to state dot wait for a. And we do that inside the initialization statement so that every time we press that in it, it always goes back to that initial state that we wanted to be starting in. Now it comes down to our switch statement here. 
we need to change our cases to what they should actually be. So in this case, it should be weight for A. Our case one is going to be weight for B. Our case two is going to be weight for X. And then our default, we don't actually have to change anything there. Now, again, we need to change what states we actually transition to. So we're going to call this one state.wait for A, state.wait for B. Oops, sorry, we actually need to transition state.wait for B, state.wait for X. And then here is going to be states.finished so that we go into that default statement. So let's go ahead and build this and let's see how this looks. While we're even going to build, we can already see that our code is significantly easier for us to read through. So as we come inside of our switch statement, we have our case that's called wait for A. That's pretty obvious. This is we are waiting for us to exit pressing the letter A. Then we have waiting for B. You can wait for it to exit B. Now you could name your states a little more something for your robot. You could have your state drive forward. You could have a state of find object. You could have a state of uh, place in basket. You could have a state of extend linear slides. Now, this is all just in autonomous. For teleop, you could have something like when the A is pressed, it extends the linear slide up to the, up to the correct height, and then it waits for the driver to release the claw or release your outtake. There are infinite possibilities you can kind of take these states to, and it makes your code a lot easier and cleaner because now we can just look at individual cases as opposed to having to sift through a large if-else statement. So let's head over to that driver hub and see what things look like over there. So let's go ahead and initialize our autonomous. And now we currently have state is wait for A, to exit state, press A. The state is wait for B, to exit state, press B. And then the state is waiting for X, to press it, press X. And now our current state is finished. So I hope you found that a really helpful introduction into state machines and how we can go about making things a little bit easier to debug make it a little closer to how robotics is actually practiced in the real world, and make your code a lot cleaner and easier to read. Uh, trust me, you will be very grateful that you have spent the time to go through and made your code easy and clean to read, because when you are stressed and you're trying to debug and trying to solve things out, making very legible code will make your life a lot easier and get rid of that issue of sort of spaghetti code. It'll also help you be able to debug specific sections of your code because you can run just specific states instead of having to wait for the entire if else uh, change run out or commenting something and then forgetting to uncomment something later. I'm sure that we've all done that. So if you have any more questions about something or state machines, let me know in the comments down below. I'll do my best to answer those. Otherwise, best of luck out there this season.